Hi and welcome to CSL Tech, my new channel. I'm Peter Briggs and I'm here to teach you about leadership. Hi and welcome. This is my first ever YouTube video, so be gentle please. I'm here to teach you about leadership, one of the most important parts of my life. One of the things that have really driven me whilst I was in service. I do think that we are lacking across the board in leadership skills and understanding leadership is such an important part of everyday life. So the concept behind these videos is to teach us all how to be better leaders. Leadership is such a dynamic and fluid set of skills that any one person showing the same amount of skills might not elicit the same response out of their team and therefore leadership is often about emotional intelligence dealing with other people, how they want to be dealt with, rather than how the leader wants to deal with their individuals. Um, before we start, a little bit about me. I've just served 22 years with the Royal Military Police in the British Army. I served operational tours in Iraq, Bosnia and Kosovo, with large-scale exercises in Poland, Oman and Canada. I served with a number of different people, from good leaders to bad leaders, in many different circumstances, in high tempo, high pressure locations. So we're gonna use some of my experiences throughout these videos to take out the theory and put it into real life scenarios. You probably won't have to deal with some of the stuff that I've had to deal with. However, it doesn't mean that it's any different. And some of the tactics, and some of the decisions that I would have made out in an operational de deployment will still be relevant to you right now. You will have dealt with people that I would have dealt with. The army is a cross dynamic of all the different types of people that we have in the UK and so will your uh, place of work. So therefore, there's a lot to learn from each other. Please put all your comments down, down below in the comment section. I'll try and get to as many as I can. This is my first video, do you remember that? And um, let's, um, let's crack on with the rest of it. So, without further ado, and my first video is gonna be on self-awareness. One of the most important parts of being a leader. So first and foremost, I must talk to you about the aims of this video. What we need to do today is uh, we're going to analyze the importance of being self-aware and how that self-awareness um, affects your own behavior. We will then understand how that behavior then impacts on other individuals and how you can adapt your behavior to improve your relationships with your team and the people around you. Finally, we'll talk about reflection and how you can use it to become a better leader. Let's have a look at the concept of self-awareness. What does self-awareness mean? Who are we as individuals and what makes you, you? We all have feelings and desires, motivations and experiences that have shaped our thoughts and actions previously. Understanding how all those qualities and beliefs shape us is to me, anyway, the best starting point from any leader. Look inside yourself and figure out who you are, what you believe in, and how you can be a better person and leader before you can start leading others. We need to be aware of how our behaviors impact on others and influence our decisions. And we should also learn how others influence us and impact on our decisions. Being self-aware can help support us to understand their emotions and the emotions of others better allowing you to interact with your team or external parties and get the most from every conversation. Being honest with yourself is the key to understanding how you feel and why. Break down what has made you feel a certain way and develop your understanding of how you can avoid confrontations when triggered. Work and being a leader should be fun and challenging. Understanding how you can maximize your own talents will allow you to know what your limits are and especially the limits of those people that work with you. You should allow you to flex yourself and your team in order to push when it's needed and relax when you have the opportunity. Understanding your own limits and the limits of your team and how far you can push yourself will really make you feel more relaxed and enjoy your job more. This also allows you to concentrate on what is truly required and learn what is important and what isn't, which is key when we come to learn about time management tools. We can become better leaders and be better overall by knowing what energizes us and what doesn't, allowing you to focus and explore your skill sets better and show others what you can do for them. So let's talk about some of the tools you can use to become more self-aware. 
One of the first you can use is uh, psychometric tools. These are a collection of online tests that you can do yourself in the comfort of your own home and they cover a vast amount of information. They can help you build a picture of yourself in almost any situation. I will link a number of different tests that you can undertake in the description below. However, I will now go on to describe some of the tests that you can undertake. We'll start with MTQ48. It's a tool that uses 48 questions um, to calculate your mental toughness or resilience. This can be used to describe the mindset that every person adopts in everything they do. It is closely related to qualities such as character resilience and grit and determination. TWOI, or the Team Working Orientation Inventory, is mainly a tool to be used by a manager or leader on their team, allowing a quick and reliable way to identify important strengths or weaknesses in the way that their team operates. TWOI is based on five elements, recognises key attributes in a high performance team. Each of these attributes has two subscales. The core elements are common goals and objectives, effective communication, continuous improvement, working together and engaging with success. The ILM72 is a unique 72 question psychometric tool which enables users to assess leadership styles and effectiveness before and after events such as a training and development or coaching program. It is a result of a major study carried out by AQR in association with ILM. It looked at over 50 leadership models and found that they all have their origins in the same components, six scales which represented different aspects of different leadership styles. The go-to psychometric tool is the Myers-Briggs Type Indicator or MBTI and it looks at personalities based on four fundamental dim dimensions of individual difference to create 16 personality type profiles. You've got extroverts or introverts, sensing or intuition, thinking and feeling and judging and perceiving. The insights game provide a framework of tackling a wealth of issues that can be applied to both professional and private areas. There are far more psychometric tools out there that I can even include in this video. However, you should go online, have a look in the description and try a couple out yourself. Just see what you can find. My issue with psychometric tools are that they're normally based on time and space and your attitude at that moment influences your decisions might not be how you feel the majority of the time, as often with these types of tests, the subjective and only guides. I do not feel comfortable pigeonholing people into boxes. This often stifles what we're trying to achieve. This is the reason why theories like this are just theories and not always practical in the real world. Let's now move on to self-reflection tools. Using a journal is a great way to reflect on the experiences that you've encountered. How this differs from a diary is the analysis conducted by yourself of the decisions during that, those experiences. Did you do it right? Did the outcome actually achieve your aim? Could you have done it better? What would you do next time? All these questions and more can be applied to your journal. There's plenty of writing journal websites on the internet and they can show you your structure on how you can be a better journal writer. Plus there are a great number of tools, including OneNote on Microsoft Outlook. These tie nicely into your emails where you can store and record your interactions. You can also use Gibbs Learning Cycle as the basis for your reflection. Another great way to write a journal is to use the STAR system. Start with situation, what were you asked to do, why and by whom. You move on to the task. This details what your purpose and the plan of the actions you're going to undertake with the explanation of why you're going to do things in a certain way and what elements of the plan had to be done in a certain order. The action, walk through what you did or were you doing. Result, what was the outcome of the work carried out? Was it a success or failure? Who provided feedback? Then you've got reflection. Did it go to plan? Did the outcome and the activity run as you expected? What would you have done and what would you change in the future? Again, there are many different ways to write reflectively. Look at how you want to use it and write it that way. Listening to your inner voice is a great way to complement writing a journal. Just talking to yourself, going over the activity of the day, just to understand what has happened before you write it down into your journal. Mindfulness can help prepare for important events as well as reflection. In the army, we would call this a condor moment. Taking the time to pause and reflect before going on to do something normally a tactical decision. 
taking a moment to calculate all variables before making your decision doesn't have to take very long and sometimes the longer you take the less of a decision has to be made that's been taken out of your hands however with careful consideration and reflection prior to the event you can almost give yourself a second chance of completing the task at hand coaching tools can aid development of self-awareness and some of the tools that we use are as follows Johari window is designed to be a self-awareness and personal development tool whereby you enter relevant information into the window panes. The exercise allows someone to pick from a preordained number of objectives, which are closely described their own personality. The subject's peers then use the same list to pick out the same number of objectives to describe the subject, and these are entered into the four quadrants of the window. The arena area, or sometimes called the open area, would contain all the objectives known by the subject and the peers. This shows the subject and peers accept that these skills and characteristics of the subject. A blind spot will contain all the objectives not selected by the subject and only by the peers. This represents information on what the subject doesn't comprehend about themselves. Hidden area or the facade would be the objectives selected by the subject and not by the peers. And these could either show the things that the peers are unaware of or they don't believe are true. Unknown are all the other remaining objectives. This process can be enlightening depending on the objectives and there are plenty that we can use and found on the internet. The Wheel of Life is often used as a coaching tool, however it can provide a great insight into self-awareness. The wheel is broken up into slices which are categorised as important to the subject and then a scoring system is used to reflect and rate your satisfaction out of 10. One being the lowest and the closest to the centre with 10 being the highest on the rim of the circle. Scores higher than 8 show satisfaction in these areas and between 5 and 7 these show that you need to engage more and these areas could be opportunities to grow. Less than 4 are areas of concern and they're clearly unsatisfied. These are where changes need to be made and explored. New opportunities are to be exploited and chances made available. You can also mark on there where you would like to be in the future allowing you to consider planning and life changes which will succeed in changing the wheel of life incrementally rather than making wholesale changes immediately. The personal SWOT is something that's often used by many managers and leaders. Not only those in self-reflection but also as a planning tool. SWOT is a very simple table divided into four parts, strengths and weaknesses and opportunities and threats. Utilising this very simple system you can highlight areas that are missing and things that might worry you in the future. However, I'm a big believer that understanding the threats and weaknesses can improve you as a leader and as a team as a whole. Whenever I see a SWOT analysis, my question is always how I will move the weaknesses or threats into the strength and opportunities box. Often, it's just a question of perspective. If we look at our current pandemic issue, which is definitely a threat, how are as businesses turning these into opportunities? Rolls-Royce changed their factories to build ventilators. Clothing companies made face covers rather than fashionable clothing. Always look to maintain your strength and maximise them whilst understanding your weakness and attempting to make them your strengths. This is how a good leader develops. When developing your self-awareness, consider your appraisals, especially from line managers. Dissect your formal feedback line by line if necessary, but do not look at this negatively. Choose to develop on the theme suggested. Use your informal feedback from colleagues and customers, but understand that an inflator ego doesn't help you develop. 360 feedback is a great way to take formal review from a large number of people and should aim to have at least four returns from here. A customer, a stakeholder, a line manager, a team member or a peer. All the questions need to be identical which will allow you to build upon your SWOT analysis or any other tools that you've used so far. Engagement surveys can provide team members with a voice on how they feel you are supporting them. This has a lot of benefits, especially if your team knows that you will try and enact on their findings. As with the 360 feedback though, it's very orientated to how other people see you. Understanding that any gripe or issue that you might have of your handling of a situation or with them themselves is more likely going to raise its head. As long as you can take the criticism, then it's a useful tool. Mentoring sessions or development activity, not unlike watching this video, will help you in the long run. Your company might be running a training day or your team is showing a new way of working and this is all a form of mentoring and understanding that not one person has all the best ideas and it's the first step to being self-aware. 
This is obviously a subject at the very heart of our social and political agenda at this moment in time. And unconscious bias is represented in every single person throughout the world. We are hardwired to feel more comfortable with people who look the same as we do and avoid situations with people that don't. We obviously have protected characteristics for all the companies to consider when employing people and these are designed to remove some of that bias. However, when we are in a room, a good leader needs to understand their bias and act against it. The first way to combat unconscious bias is to admit that we have it. Once you're honest with yourself, you can push yourself to step outside the confines of your normal sensibilities and speak and interact with people beyond the same characteristics that you possess. If you look at your team and people have the same backgrounds and come from the same place socially, then you'll tend to have an echo chamber effect. And I often akin this to Parliament, when people from all parties come from the same demographics, being from the same schooling system, from the same class, generally from the same race and sex. Things are changing, but if you want highly functioning competitive teams, then do not surround yourself with people who have the same life experiences and therefore the same answers. To get people to think outside the box, make sure you have different perspectives because that will often make sure that you look from different perspectives yourself. Leaders and managers need to be aware of how their behaviour is perceived by others and how it impacts on other people's behaviours. Being in a position of responsibility and influence means that leaders need to be cognizant of their weaknesses and strengths and not let personal beliefs or opinions impact on their, on their decisions unduly. Whilst I was in the army, the Royal Military Police Corps motto was lead by example and this is almost always true as being a leader. Ensure that you engage with your team and others and get across your point correctly. Make sure you, they feel like you care about them, that you respect them and that they are valued. Be fair and consistent when making decisions or problem solving. This can be firm but fair too when dealing with discipline. Let your team know that no one gets special treatment, including yourself. Follow good working practices. Allow others to feel safe in the environment that you're providing and that you're not cutting corners for profit. Perform to a high level consistency, showing that you are leading the way to achieve the aims, targets or deadlines and that your quality does not drop. Good time and keeping is a must. Ensure that you're never late. Always set up on time and put the effort in to make sure that things work out before the event occurs. This shows that you care about what you're producing and they set a good example for the others to follow. Dismiss the saying, do as I say and not as I do. Those days are well past. Now all leaders should be held to a higher standard and should always be professional. Negative behaviour can be stated as being the opposite of all the traits explained on the previous slide. I've written an article on toxic behaviour on leadership which is published on my LinkedIn profile and if there's any call for it I'll do a video. Leave your comments in the section below. Understanding self-awareness is half the battle. Improving your understanding will make you a better leader but implementing some of these ideas will make you a better person which will allow others to want to be led by you. Understanding how you are beyond your own roast into glasses and laid bare for scrutiny is very hard for some and sometimes it can be close to the bone. But understanding what impact you are having both positively and negatively will help shape yourself into a more rounded leader and a better manager. Never stop trying to be better. There are so many different tools out there for you to try and constantly use feedback to learn. Remember, leaders create leaders. It's a blessing and a curse at the same time. Use your responsibility wisely. Hi there, I'm Pete Briggs and this is CSN Tech. Here we're going to have another video on self-awareness and today our video is going to be about learning stats. Last week we spoke about self-awareness and unconscious bias. This week is all about learning styles and how you can use learning styles to further yourself and your team to get better results. Um, and so uh, let's just get on with the rest of the video. Today's video we will mainly go through a number of the theories on learning styles. We'll piece together information that you can make an informed decision on what you would like to use. We will address how learning influences training and development and how you can focus on your team's learning style in order to produce better results. We will also focus on how you can use your knowledge of learning styles to become a better leader. Part of self-awareness is understanding your learning style, which will in turn help you to understand the learning styles of your team. 
If you can understand that you have a specific learning requirement when learning, then you will be able to develop an all-encompassing, holistic view on learning styles of your team and be able to develop a package to teach the skills needed to all your team members in a way that magnifies their learning styles. Understanding your learning style is a great way to start off your development action plan, which is sometimes called the DAP, or your continuous professional development, which is also sometimes abbreviated as CPD. An updated and frequently maintained DAP will show your growth as an individual. Firstly, you need to be looking at your current roles and responsibilities and detail where the gaps are in your portfolio. Then we need to analyse where you want to be in the future, what skills do you want to show and what qualities do you have to achieve these. Then the action plan comes in. How are you going to get there? What courses are you going to attend? What learning are you going to take on? And how much development you'll personally need to have to get to the position that you want? This all comes down to your learning style. There is no point sat there po listening to podcasts if you're an audible learner. So you've got to adapt to your learning style. Today's video will be concentrating on the following theories. Vark, Gardner's multiple intelligences, Field Silverman learning style, Kolb's learning style, and Honey Munford. However, there are plenty more to look at on the internet, such as CS383, Ideal, Mazplang, Tango, and Aha. Vark explains that people normally have a favorite way of learning, and therefore training needs to be adapted to suit these preferences. Usual watching or seeing activity completed lends itself to visual learners. YouTube lends itself well to this area, and more children are growing up as visual learners as a result. Graphs and data can add more information for these learners. Listening or speaking are auditory learners. How many times have you explained something and suddenly it makes more sense? Listening to people explain something might also be the key to unlocking your learning, as well as asking questions and listening to those answers. Reading and writing is about being able to read instructions or notes and understand them. Research is also a great way for these learners to develop and writing notes during training is important. Kinetic is about getting your hands dirty and actually doing it and touching it. These sometimes can be switched from visual learners and both visual and kinesthetic learners both draw information from the other's learning style. However, to really understand the subject, the preferred method must be used. The idea is that most people will have a preferred learning style and that leaders can make sure that they hit all the bases with designing their training. For example, you can conduct a presentation with a video and written handouts, maybe with diagrams. You will describe the training thoroughly and when you conduct some hands-on training in a safe environment with suitable supervision. This way, all the different types of learners will have some version of learning that they require. I like this idea, but I'm also an advocate that skills and learning can be any of the above for any single person. When you get a flat pack wardrobe from Ikea, the instructions are paramount, and therefore, I'd be a reading and writing learner. However, when I'm playing on my computer games, I seek walkthroughs on YouTube, and therefore, I'm more of a visual learner. However, when I learned to drive a car, I was kinesthetic because I needed to feel and drive a vehicle to actually understand how it all worked. Gardner's multiple intelligences is a theory based on how people understand and perceive the world differently. This was further refined, but the theory states there are three different intelligences. Gardner said there's a wide range of cognitive abilities that only have a weak correlation between them. His theory predicts that a child who learns math easily is not necessarily more intelligent than the child that finds math hard, and that they may learn to do maths in different ways or different, have different approaches. The child struggling with maths may also excel in different areas outside of the discipline and may be looking too deep into the subject matter and therefore overcomplicating the task. This means that a child that struggles with the subject might actually be hiding a potentially higher level of intelligence of the child that has memorised maths quickly. This misunderstanding can lead to the detrimental effect on the child. Let's look at the eight intelligences. People with a high verbal linguistic intelligence displays a facility with words and languages. They're typically good at reading and writing, can tell stories and memorising words along with dates. They tend to learn best by reading or taking notes and listening to lectures and by being discussed or debating what they've learned. Logical or mathematical? Using logic and reasoning, numbers or patterns. While it's often assumed that those with intelligence naturally excel in mathematics, chess, computer programs or any other logical or numerical activities, the more accurate definition places less emphasis 
on traditional mathematics ability and more on reasoning capabilities, recognizing abstract patterns, scientific thinking, and investigation and the ability to perform calculations. Spatial, being able to mentally visualize, plan, and be aware of space and distance. Careers that suit these types of intelligence include artists, designers, and architects. A spatial person is really good with puzzles. Bodily or kinetic, using your body to solve problems, hands-on sort of people. The core elements of bodily kinetic intelligence are control of one's body's motions and the capability to handle objects skillfully. Gardner elaborates to state that these intelligences also include the sense of timing, a clear sense of goal of a physical action, along with the ability to train responses so that they are more like reflexes. In theory, people who are body kinetic intelligent should learn better by involving muscular movement and are generally better at physical activities such as sport and dance. They may enjoy acting or performing and in general they're good at building and making things. They often learn best by doing things physically rather than by reading or hearing about it. Musical. Sensitivity to sounds, rhythms and tones of music. People with high musical intelligence normally have a good pitch and may even have an absolute pitch. They are able to sing, play musical instruments and compose music. Since they are a strong auditory component to this intelligence, those who are strongest in it may learn via a lecture. Interpersonal. Good communication skills, great at negotiation or developing friendships and relationships. Interpersonal intelligence is the ability to understand others. In theory, individuals who have a high interpersonal intelligence are characterised by their sensitivities to others, moods, feelings and temperaments and motivations, and their ability to cooperate in order to work as part of a group. Intrapersonal, self-reflective, self-awareness, understanding what motivates themselves. This refers to having a deep understanding of yourself and what strengths and weaknesses are. What makes you unique? Being able to predict your own reactions and emotions. Philosophical and critical thinking is common with this intelligence. Naturalistic. This has to do with nurturing and related information on one's natural surroundings. Examples include classifying natural forms such as animals and plant species and rocks and types of mountains. And the applied knowledge of, of nature in farming and mining. Although the roots of Feldman Silverman's learning style model lies in the engineering world, the theory can be used in other industries. The model shows four areas of personality and a combination of these styles show that they're learning preferences. Active or reflective. This shows how people process the information given to them. Active people tend to want to work things out and work in groups, whereas reflective people prefer to work alone or in familiar teams. Visual or verbal. This shows how information is presented. Visual learners prefer videos or information in pictures or charts. Verbal prefer written word or spoken answers. Sensing or intuitive. This shows how people wish to perceive information. Sensing learners want concrete information and are themselves practical thinkers, enjoying facts and processes. Intuitive people prefer thinking with conceptual theories. Sequential or global. This is how people like to organise and process information. Sequential learners prefer small, linear thinking, using small steps towards their goal. Whereas global thinkers prefer holistic learning with large steps. Cole's experiential learning module uses four points to identify how people learn. According to Cole's model, the ideal learning process engages all four of these models in response to situationary demands. They form a learning cycle, from experience to observation to conceptualization to experimentation and back to experience. In order for learning to be effective, Cobb suggests all four of these approaches must be used in training and learning. Experience, the first attempt or actually doing the skills. Reflecting, much like any other reflection, looking back on what's occurred, using the information to see what you would do better next time and how useful the experience was. Three, thinking. Using theories and any other ideas that relate to the learning experience and integrate them into your learning. 4. Acting. The test phase, where the learner puts to practice what they've learned. This rotational cycle shows that learners should touch every area when learning. Building upon Kolb's experimental learning model is the Honey and Mumford learning cycle. Here, 
We've got activists who are people who like change and go out and seek learning. We've got reflectors, people stand back and review learning. Theorists, people who wish to learn more through logical processes. And the pragmatist, people who like to try new things and solve the problems. These four learning styles are acquired preferences that are adaptable, either at will or through changed circumstances, rather than being fixed personality characteristics. Making the most of our own and our team's preferred learning styles will help us make the most out of our training opportunities, allowing everyone to develop in a way they prefer and make the learning more enjoyable with an increased chance of the training being successful, saving money and time in the process. As an individual, you should work out your own learning style and ensure that you conduct learning in the way that suits you. Using activities like delegation, job rotations, shadowing and e-learning can help support all the different types of learners in your team to develop. By using analysis on our own way of thinking can help us to plan learning strategies that work for us and our teams. It can help supporters become more organised and choose effective methods for different learning tasks. There are a number of ways that you can use to identify your learning style and the learning style of your team. Some of these will be questionnaires and some theories have web browser activities that you can undertake. I'll link a few in the comments below. If you want to know more about yourself, consider how you learn in different circumstances. Do you like to be guided or do you like to be shown? Do you need to write instructions or do you like a video? This should easily point you towards understanding what, how you want to learn and how easy it is to use the right system to get the right results. The same principle can be applied to your team. Ask them or observe them. Gather the information required by watching your team and understanding what works for them as a cohort or as individuals. Just remember, learning is often context driven, so one way of learning will not always solve your problems. However, it should highlight new ways of working. Understanding your team's learning style and implementing it will help you and your team massively. The first step to understanding your team though is your own understanding of yourself. Being aware will always be the best way to understand how other people work. Understanding that you have needs will allow you to cater for the needs of others more. This is how a leader magnifies the skills of his own team, shows effort into understanding what the team needs and how their impact can be maximised. Consider the questions on screen and hopefully they can inspire you to work out what you need and what your team needs. Hi and welcome to CSM Tag. I'm Peter Briggs. This week we have an interview with a current serving soldier and an instructor at Phase 2 training in the British Army. He's going to discuss to us how um, training has evolved over the last 20 years and how, they're, how the British Army are now using the most up-to-date learning styles in order to get the best out of their recruits. Um, so I just wanted to introduce uh, Clint. Clint worked with me at 156 Provost Company as my training senior NCO, and um, he's been working at phase two training at the Royal Military Police uh, Training School. Uh, is it called the Royal Military Police Training School now, Clint? It's the uh, Defence College of Policing and Guarding, to be technically correct. So he, Clint worked there um, as a phase two instructor. Do you want to introduce yourself, Clint? Yeah, hello everyone. My name's uh, Clint Breeden. I'm still currently a staff sergeant in the Royal Military Police uh, and throughout my career, clearly obviously I worked for, for Pete, um, but I've also worked as a phase one instructor where we take civilians and then turn them into phase one uh, soldiers, where I was a section commander in charge of uh, 10 people specifically who I directly influenced. And then um, fast forward a few years, I was then the course coordinator for the Tri-Service Police School. So that was covering uh, Royal Military Police, RAF Police and the Royal Navy Regulators through their trade training and then most recently I've just concluded as a permanent staff instructor at Sandhurst uh, delivering a module on the reserve commissioning course. Thank you very much Clint. So today we're going to be mainly talking about how the military have evolved um, in training its soldiers and its recruits and the way that it's in for, um, influenced its uh, learning styles as well. So firstly I want to talk about the training pipeline. Now we had a training pipeline at Colchester um, which me and you developed um, in order to get our soldiers from, from A to B um, and deployable for what was the Air Assault Task Force um, 
working with a 16 parachute regiment. But I just want to talk to you how that works with um, phase two recruits, getting them to the op standard. So I think it's similar to what um, what we did at, at Colchester. You know, everyone needs to look at what the output is going to be. And obviously with the military police, you know, that output is defined by policy and a, and a training directive for want of a, for a better word. So, you know, that then works backwards so you then have for phase two with the Royal Military Police you then have a output and your start state now clearly our start state is what phase one delivers into phase two so you've got that common military syllabus those 14 weeks of uh, basic soldiering training that everybody in the military does you know everyone in the army does exactly the same syllabus and then everyone is moved to their various trades or their various you know uh, regimental training and obviously for us it's down down in Portsmouth for the at the uh, DSPG so uh, at that point, then it, they go through, I think it's the best part of six months of, um, of development covering a number of sub subject matters. And um, one of the last things that we did was a very, very big turn of the wheel where we reassessed everything that we delivered as and the Royal Military Police versus our output and our, our input state. And there was a huge change of um, what training we were delivering our, um, our students. So... Um, in, t in terms of pipeline, we decided that the most effective way of doing this, you know, being, being police officers, is that, you know, the policing aspect of our job realistically needed to be at the back end of the course so that the um, guys and girls would be leaving the policing college with the uh, freshest memory of those policing skill sets. And you could argue as soldiers, you know, oh, what about all the soldiering? Well, what we decided, because they'd come from phase one, is that, you know, those green skills were fresh in their mind and they were of a certain mindset. So we need to capitalise on, on that ability. So we put all the green stuff, front loaded it whilst they were still in that sort of army mindset. And then we, you know, ticked off all those training objectives, you know, be it, you know, the pistol ranges, which are specific to us, a bit of chemical warfare, a bit elevation of physical assessments and all that, all that good army stuff, the green stuff, we call it, that got done first. They then went into a consolidation sort of period of um, like classroom learning. So where we would then deliver all of the criminal law aspects and the military law aspects of, of their trade. Uh, and that was obviously delivered uh, with a number of my teams. Um, and then from that, they go into a period of environmental training. So a bit like Big Brother's watching you. So police station, cameras everywhere. You know, we've got screens behind walls. We can watch interviews. We can watch interaction. Uh, and whilst that was all happening environmentals, they'd be touching on their um, arrest and restraint. So we call it PST training. Um, and then there's a few more bits of physical stuff. Um, and then a bit of driver training before they, they drop out the back end. So the this pipeline starts from sort of civilian soldier military skills up to your annual standard of tests. A bit of refresher and special to arm training for the military police, which is the, our, our MP green stuff into tuition okay classroom based theoretical criminal law sort of trade training assessment out the door into the into the field army how, how did you think that the uh doing it that way around so you did some special to arm training and then you did theory behind it how did that work for you okay so um dspg in the in the various guises that that organization has been and obviously me and you worked for a different organization obviously when we went through um three training um when we went through it was run by the army it was it was the royal military police training school and that was it obviously now it's tri service now the fact that it's tri service is probably has the biggest influence on how that places run and how we deliver training because three services require three different mindsets from its students you know th it's three different outputs we are still soldiers and we still have to do soldiering stuff so we need to be able to get from a to b as a soldier first to deliver our specialism our trade and our provost support to whatever battle group we're attached to whereas you know the navy they do it the other way around they come as already trained sailors they've already got a trade in the navy for a couple of years and they've got experience and they probably hold a bit of rank before they become police officers and then they go back to the Navy again. So, you know, you're starting with this different level of all sorts at the start of our now phase two uh, um, at the, the Tri-Service School. 
so um, it was it was one of my suggestions about the order with which we were training and, and the school has conformed to the kind of the theory and the environmental training was the same order as it was for me and you um, I would suggest when me and you went through we have kind of gone back to what that roughly looked like a very different inf um, sort of influence and a very different emphasis on how the course is delivered of course because we've moved on 22 years since then um, but for me it, it comes down to that real clinical assessment of what am I starting with and what is my output and you know in the military we are very very mission focused so the mission is I need to deliver combat ready highly qualified highly motivated Royal Military Police, junior NCOs, not private soldiers, people that hold rank and responsibility. How do I get him to land in Colchester uh, and then obviously end up doing what me and you had been designing? And, you know, and we know and people that have come from a training school came to Colchester and were like, whoa, wow, we've gone from here to, to here. So I then left Colchester and went to the school. We did a big, um, a massive, massive study that involved, you know, right up to sort of Provost Marshal Army, which is the top end of our organisation as a, as a cap badge. And, you know, that study went right the way up to the top and they shook everything out. And there was, you know, a lot of a lot of meetings, a lot of study, you know, a lot of interrogation of statistics and you know, injury levels and subject matter and, and absolutely everything. It's a really, 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 really worthwhile task. And it has, I would argue, transformed what we're delivering you know much more digestible a lot more logical um you know it, in, in a manner which is um quite easily delivered really you know if you've got the right the right instructors so for me moving to that point where we you know we were receiving phase one soldiers just keeping them in that soldiery bit to start with in phase two because you don't want to take the foot off the pressure you know they're still in training there's still a lot of the lifestyle and environment that they need to learn and understand and you know you're still at a training school where we can facilitate that learning and mold and mentor that learning without it being too overpowering so they've still got access to all the good welfare stuff before they go to the field army where it's a bit different um and i think that if we didn't do it like that and we, we took away that green stuff at the end and we and we at the beginning when we moved that to the end the soldiers would then become lazy you know they they their foot's been taken off the gas they're now in the classroom chilling out learning you know interaction like this with their instructors because clearly there's a difference in familiarity when we're trying to deliver that amount of criminal law you know we it just just for me it, it lost pace and when we moved it all around you know it just the difference in standards, you know, was was immediately visible you know, around camp in, in just turnout, appearance, bearing, and then clearly that affects their motivation and their morale and their commitment to what to what they're doing. And if you move where they get their red berry and their patch, you know, for us like the paras, you know, we have to earn that. You know, if they get that too early, they think they've passed. You know, we want to tactically place that so they they work for it. That's in the site. They you know it's, it, they can always smell it and touch it, but they've got to earn it. You know, and then when they've got it, you know, the pride that they feel is 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 something else. And you can then harness that pride, and that's what you're sending them to the to their units with. You know, that that belief that they they belong to you know the the, the family that is the military police. Then perfect. Um, could you? So the army's evolved, and it's had to over the last. 20 years since you joined up and I joined up um, and we've had instances like deep cuts um, and um, events that have occurred that have questioned the military's uh, commitment to uh, training and the way that it delivers training. Could you explain the differences um, of the training delivery and its focus from the last 20 years please? Yeah of course so um, I think I alluded to earlier that when me and you went through through training, we went through training in Chichester when it was a Royal Military Police training school. And, you know, subject matter was delivered at us. So you had an expert, you know, in a, in a certain subject, be it weapons or chemical warfare, or, you know, someone who's um, really experienced at the policing aspects and criminal law was their, was their thing. Someone may have been all over forensics. So you would have had a forensic expert deliver those lessons. So those guys would um, would come into a classroom and would be sat like we were at school, and those lessons were just PowerPoint or overhead projection, and you were just spoken to book, download, delivery of subject matter, and there was no consideration back there for sort of learning styles or learning difficulties. There was no assessments then on on anything. You just you just kept up, 
and um, and you were given your three exams over that period of time in that in that, in that syllabus. And if you failed your exams, you're off your back squatted, you know, and you just go through that cycle again and again. And, you know, and, and that's what it was like um, 20 years. Ago. It was probably even worse before our time, I would have thought, you know, a, a lot more direct, probably a lot more, um, I say brutally delivered, but a lot more blunt in how it was given to you. You know, there you go. There's your subject matter. Learn it. Done. You know, no discussion. But as years have gone on, and I think as the um, as society has become very aware of um, of learning styles and how we best affect output and the mission through um, ensuring that stuff is delivered to all levels, all ability. You know, we, we coin a phrase in, in the military now, which is we train in, we don't select out. So I think you could argue back in our day, it was almost like they wanted the finished product at the start it's almost like they wanted the soldier that was already fit the soldier that already knew about his police work or found the police work easy and you know and there was people that just fit into that and that was fine whereas now there is it's nothing nothing like that you know i i expect those guys that came to phase two to know nothing they were a blank blank canvas and each one of them is an individual that learns in a different manner so the army has moved with this and um you know has created a process where our instructors are developed and our instructors are mentored and assessed and trained in how to deliver their various subjects so it doesn't matter what your subject is or what regiment you belong to as an instructor there are fundamental principles and um you know delivery methods that we will stick to of which is quite a few um and then you utilize that toolbox of you know training delivery to best suit either your your subject that you're teaching or the learning styles of, of your students so you know something theoretical may be done in a in a certain manner something practical will be done in, in another manner but each one facilitates those different learning styles with a um with not a pressure on the student because of how these learning styles work. So what you're trying to do is, is mentor, massage, and increase your output by delivering these lessons in a manner that they can learn it and digest it as quickly and as easily, and they can implement it almost immediately. And then you'll see that, if, you, if you've nailed it, you'll see that reflect in your, in your statistics. So this switch that the army has made from download to training in, has had a huge, huge impact. And specifically at DSPG, um, we had a learning styles um, civilian teacher. She was permanently based there with us. Every intake that I had from phase one, my guys were put through a, a maths and English assessment, regardless of whether they got GCSEs and A-levels, they would go through this assessment and then we would triage every intake. So, you know, your 30 guys turn up for that platoon. Within that assessment, I would then be briefed on each one of my soldiers this guy has undiagnosed uh, dyslexia. This guy can't spell. This woman can't do maths. You know, and none of and they've all got all through their schooling. They've all got their results. But because we knew this, you know, we knew um, some people need to read with a block of blue filter over their over their textbooks. You know, that's a really easy fix. But that that guy or girl that might be looking at this test book too scared to say anything for however long, and all it took was a blue filter over and then the world's unlocked and it's, it's easy so you know and the whole army across all all um, trades is like is like this now we track we train in we don't select out so so the last video that i did i did about learning styles and how each individual has requirements on uh, learning styles different ways of learning themselves but how does that equate to something as tangible as uh, like weapon um weapons for example uh, stripping a weapon down um, I know how I learned how to strip a weapon down. I might not be <laughs> <I did. laughs> yeah. who, who, who knows? But how do you do that now with with these different ways of working with learning styles and something that's very, very tangible, such as stripping a weapon down? Okay, so, you know, the weapons issue is a really, really good point. And uh, when you go and do your, like, instructor assessments and your instructor sort of continued personal development courses, you know, this one comes up a lot um, because at the end of the day, um, there's something with criminal law, you can find a lot of that out on the internet. You know, someone can go and find the theft that the Criminal Damage Act, you know, and they can look and do some pre-study. We can give them pre-seize to give them a head start. Weapons, you know, 
um, it is what it is and it has to be delivered in a, in a certain manner one because of the safety aspect um, of, of dealing with weapon systems um, and, and two there is elements of those lessons which by law have to be said verbatim um, you know for insurance purposes and you know so that the army as a corporate organization is a hundred percent clear on this piece of subject has been said in that manner to that student so then your question about you know how we utilize the modern the modern way of teaching um, if you've got learning styles across your group so weapons is normally taught in classes of 10 in in phase one you know i would argue a third of your of your 10 people as a skill arms instructor are going to have learning difficulties um, so what you do is you ensure that your your lesson caters for all types of learning so being it you know kinesthetic or a visual learner uh, or an audio learner you know so i personally would have something recorded for someone to listen to in their own time so they can just put it in their ears play back if they're a visual learner they're going to get a handout at the start of the lesson with all the pictures on it that they can then annotate and write on at their own leisure putting down the things that they know they need to put down to add to that visual aid but obviously bearing in mind that you know Doing the weapon system is visual anyway because they're, they're looking at you but um, but some people just work better with pictures and those guys like me and you that you know touch stuff need to touch and play with it and mess around or whatever they get the best part of 40 minutes because you're touching a weapon system so you you're um, picking every one of those ways of learning and you just make sure you've you've got something in every lesson you deliver that is has the ability to be given to your students and clearly we know who has the learning difficulties? So I'll know who the visual learner is. I'll know who, you know, the guy that needs the extra 10 minutes, you know, then I end up positioning myself so I can keep the eye on the guy that needs the extra 10 minutes. I know that my ex cadets or reservist soldiers that are now going regular, they're at that end and they're influencing at the other end of the classroom. So there's so much that, that, that you can do, but as an instructor, it's your responsibility to make sure that your lesson does have every element of those learning styles is covered you know and as an instructor you are assessed on that you know people come and assess you teaching your lesson and if you haven't covered them off someone's gonna be having a chat with you to say you didn't cover visual learning in your in your lesson so how many visual learners do you have in your class and if you know the answers to and you didn't do it you're reteaching that lesson because they've missed subject matter um, so you, you spoke there about um, some students having learning difficulties so what support is given to those soldiers whilst they have difficulty learning um, whilst at phase two? Oh, this is fantastic. So this is something that we've got really, really, really right in the modern era. Um, you know, my, even my own eyes were opened when I went down to DSPG. And um, clearly for us in our trades, you know, the hardest bit is the criminal law because it is very, very full on for, I say a short period of time, for about a month, you know, you are just immersed in criminal law. And uh, for those that haven't been to uni or done A-levels, you know, that can be just quite challenging in itself because on top of that, they're doing their military physical assessments and training every day. You're doing revision on other military aspects as well as learning how to live in a military environment, you know, being away from home and all these other pressures. And then someone's just, you know, all this criminal law on you. So... The way that we've um, we've got around to support in this is it starts in the training pipeline right back at phase one. And, you know, um, certainly when I worked with the um, junior intakes, so the 16 year olds that, that came to me when I was at Buzzingbourne at phase one, um, they also would go through a maths and English assessment and obviously like a triage of their learning styles. And if there was any undiagnosed learning difficulties and it starts right right at the beginning and, you know, Everyone may go through that assessment and you, and you get the results. That doesn't mean that the assessments have stopped. You know, you as an instructor or the platoon sergeant or platoon commander, you've got your eye on all of those guys. And if something's not right, we've always got people to go to. So like I said, at phase one, if there were people that were struggling, they would get extra time with tutors, be it for maths and English. And if they'd not achieved their maths and English, we would be putting them through the, um, the MVQ equivalents whilst in training. So they would leave phase one training having achieved a maths and English pass equivalent of a C, you know, and, and that is on top of extra in, in line with the training that they were already doing. So, you know, if everyone passed already and they were fine, that's cool. They don't need to do it. But those that need the support were given that maths and English. Now, bearing in mind as a senior NCO, you need to be at level two um, to hold senior NCO rank. So, and in a raw military police, you need to be at level two as well. So, you know, 
um, the guys that would then come to us at phase two, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time already had their GCSEs and stuff anyway. So, um, but you would have people with learning difficulties. So they would go through that triage process and then they would have regular time with the, um, the, the learning support tutor. They would have extra time in examinations to obviously compensate for someone who's a slow reader. You know, why impose the same time frame on them when it takes them an extra five minutes to read a paper? So, you know, um, we have exactly the same allowances that you'd get like for your GCSEs. We would do exactly the same uh, at DSPG, more time in exams one-on-one -on -one time with the tutor <laughs> and then as the training staff you know you're pretty much you know seeing these guys day in day out anyway and you know all of like the corporal instructors the section commanders would be putting in you know a horrendous amount of extra time delivering and mentoring and helping these guys that were struggling through because we train in you know we want these people to pass we want them to get to the end you know we want them to have a fulfilled and successful career in the military um, and to do that they've got to pass their tests but you know they're willing to help themselves and put the time in then we give it back to them you know beneath the embers british ipa brewed in conjunction with wibblers brewery essex made only with british hops brewed with attitude just like beneath the embers music you can purchase your beer via beneaththeembers.com or via Wibbler's website direct. Click the link below to get your beer. So um, I've heard that the army utilises a mentoring system to enhance training. Can you explain that? Can you? Mm. Okay, so this is where the army's targeted its um, ability to influence the... the um, the amount of students that are coming through the the training pipeline so uh, the army obviously worked out probably within the last sort of 15 years that you know just having an instructor or corporate sergeant just you know screaming and shouting at people actually doesn't really affect a large proportion of, of an intake you know one third of that intake you know may react positively to that kind of leadership or you know um direct form of teaching but um, what we've we've since worked out that you know if you want results you know and st statistic led results um we have to we have to do something different and the focus isn't on the student at that point the focus and the mentoring is actually at the instructors and the chain of command that, that run training so um everyone that teaches in any form of military establishment now be it phase one phase two or you know further continued trade training which we call phase three um, they have to go and uh, have uh, an assessment and a course for a couple of weeks in Purbright. It's a place called the Army School of Leadership and uh, it's run by a multitude of cat badges, all of them horrendously experienced instructors. Uh, most of them, uh, well, all of them will be a minimum of a staff sergeant or a colour sergeant, so have already worked in all of the training establishments. And um, you then go through, let's say as a phase one or phase two instructor, you go through a two week package. And on that two week package, your eyes are opened to learning styles, you know, learning difficulties, how to communicate with young people, welfare of young people. You know, it's nothing to do with your chosen trade or your own subject matter as instructor. Um, it's all to do with how you as a person delivers your subject matter to your students, you know the roles and responsibilities uh, on you because you know those people that come into training are vulnerable are vulnerable men and women um you know they are in a position of vulnerability of which you're leading and you know bear no bones about it us in the army are employed to do a certain job which some of it's not very nice um so we do need a certain type of character and we but we need to know how to pull that character out of someone in a manner which is both professional and effective um and the mentoring process process doesn't just stop after your two weeks at the, the school in Purbright. Um, there's, a, there's almost a rank structure to it. So as you go through as an instructor, you, um, you finish, you get qualified, you go back to your training establishment. You are then the bottom of a rung of three steps on a ladder. At the bottom, it's called DTTT aware. So it's defence trainer trainer aware. Okay, so you've been made aware of all this subject matter. You have learned, you've been assessed, your lessons have been looked at. The army has said, yes, you as a person now hold the knowledge, have the character, and you're the right quality of individual to go and teach. Tick. So you, you go to your school. 
Then you have someone like me, which is called an army trainer mentor, mentor or a defense trainer mentor. What I then do is all the new instructors that come to my um, establishment. So let's say in Portsmouth for DSPG, I was directly responsible for all of the army, the RMP, military police, senior NCOs, so your sergeants and above that worked for my company, which was the trade training. All of them, senior NCOs, so sergeants, all of the corporals, I then, if you like, was their master coach. So I would then go and look at their lessons, their delivery lessons, ensuring that their delivery conformed to the correct structure of how we teach now, which then aids your uh, learning styles. I would look at the um, content of what was meant to be delivered in that lesson. So let's go back to the theft act. It needs to cover a few key areas, you know, key learning points. So I'll be making sure those instructors were hitting those key learning points whilst utilizing all these new methods of teaching. Um, and then that instructor or those instructors would then have a one-on-one -on -one mentoring session with me straight after their lesson, where I would use a process of bringing out of them where they think they could improve. So, you know, to cut a long story short, you know, I've, I've done their job. So, you know, I, I know what needs to be hit. I am now the most experienced instructor within that organisation. So I know the emphasis that we want to be teaching to our students. So I know, I know what our output is and I know how, what the mannerisms with which my instructors need to be doing it. So then I'd sit with the guys and then we would review the lesson, we'd reflect on the lesson and I would get them obviously to pick out, you know, three really good areas they thought went really, really well. And then three areas that they didn't think went so well. I myself would have picked three areas, you know, that um, I didn't think went very well, but obviously I'll keep them to myself. But um, in that reflection period when we'd be talking, um, nine times out of 10, those instructors would bring up as their three negative points, the three points that I probably picked up as well. And that's where we want to be getting at because the onus becomes then on that instructor to better himself. And then we then set some goals. You know, we use the smarter model quite a lot in the army. You know, we'd set, right, okay, so what do we want to hit for your next lesson? What are those three things that we didn't think went so well? What are we going to nail next time? And we'd pick one, maybe two goals. You know, I, I want to take less on my introduction, for example. So yeah, we, we put that down there, we record it. It's on there. We set a date for the next review. And then he goes away and he works on it. He does some more lessons. I go back for another assessment. And then when we do that reflection, and when we do that reflection again, we just make sure he's hit that goal that he set and it starts again. So then you go on to the second run of the ladder. ladder um, when, I've, when I've done maybe three assessments and I'm happy that he's got the process nailed. And then towards the end of his time, he'd probably done that third run before he then thinks of qualifying like I would be. So that second tour instructor, senior NCO, you'd probably be looking at me in an, an army or defence trainer mentor if you've got the right background. And then I would answer to one army instructional leader who's you know, normally a W01, top dog, you know, so sergeant major level. And, you know, he would be the one mentoring me, mentoring the mentors. And it's that, like, that, that chain of command. So we use the rank structure, we use the experience. And, you know, one is checking on the other, reflecting with the other, and it, and it works up works up uh, and the results speak for themselves you know our retention at the at the training school is is n i would suggest pretty much 98 percent. i reckon um you know and, and the way that we do that just affects everything how we communicate with the students you know notwithstanding the fact we're in the army and there is good army stuff that needs to happen bit of drill bit of shouty shouty you know the usual army stuff um but the emphasis on making the student feel included, making sure that they know that they can speak to the instructors, that they are mentored, not spoken at, you know, that they belong to, you know, to that organisation, you know, learning isn't, isn't a problem, believe it or not. It's a big hurdle they think they have when they're a week in, it's, it's like, it's just easy. So what else do you do to uh, develop your mentor staff? So that's mainly internal. So is we got yep. external elements? Yep. So um, you would go and do your first two-week course at the Army Leadership School. Now, bearing in mind that if you do a two-year tour at a training school, you know, once you've done your course there, that's you delivering either as a, you know, trainer mentor or as instructor, you're delivering for two years. Let's say you go back to the field army. When you come back to a training establishment, you will go back to the Army Leadership School and you will either go and do the next course up or you will go and redo the course that you've done before to make sure that all the modern ways of teaching are refreshed in your mind or you're updated on anything. So, you know, I'm a really good example. I did um, D Triple T version one. Um, so I went to Perp Roy, and this is when it was first invented, really. So we're talking, 
2007, I think it was when I did the first version. And, um, you know, I, I gained civilian qualifications through it, which actually meant that I didn't need to go back when I was at phase two. However, my army instructor leader, the sergeant major at the top said, you're going back because you need to be updated with the modern way of doing stuff. And, you know, my eyes were open to a whole new world of, of teaching that hadn't been delivered to me when I'd done version one. So it was the, absolutely the right thing to do was to send me back, even though I was civilian qualified, to go back and you know get that continued professional development in an area that you know I would argue that I'm you know pretty expert at um, for for my um, professionality you know with, within the military. Um, yeah, to go back and get updated, and then if you like when you're at a training school you know you've always got the new army trainer mentors coming through that are then mentoring the instructor so you've got this continued download of updates and information within your rank structure within your school and every time you go back uh, and then obviously we utilize guest speakers people from outside our organization we bring these people in you know maybe the executive mentoring from you know big businesses big you know london firms something that's nothing to do with the military but something that needs to display leadership or commitment or something that we would utilize and we get them in and then the instructors go and do continued professional development probably every quarter within be it you know Portsmouth and um, we learn more and we we broaden our horizons and we open our eyes to not just what the army wants and needs but what else is out there that we can that we can use so yeah, it's continuous all the time brilliant one thing I'm always asked about because the British Army's should be good at it, um, mental resilience. And how do you build mental resilience in? So you've got all these extra, um, you know, you've got learning styles, you've got different people at different levels of understanding and learning, but you still got to have a soldier at the end of it. So how do you develop mental resilience um, in training? Mate, that is such, um, such a big question. And I think that... Um, the answer to that is, is massively long-winded and there was a lot of what ifs and so what's with mental resilience. Now, clearly you must always remember that, you know, um, mental resilience is a hot topic and the way that we have to conduct ourselves in the military has to conform to the law, has to conform to professionality. So with, with that, we must always bear in mind if we're going to start conducting some form of training that is um, well outside of you know the civilian realm of mental resilience so let's say for example you know being in combat you know we we need soldiers that are able to deliver a function um almost automatically where their mind and their commitment is completely focused and unwavering to deliver that end task and uh, you know at the basic level that is get in a trench and kill someone is, is the long shot no matter what trade you are in the army you are paid to shoot and to fight um, and then deliver your trade second you're right, that takes, um, you know, the infantry will deal with it in a certain way from day one. Us as tradesmen, we have to take our military training and we have to do it in that way. Then we take our trade training and then we've got to meet it in the middle somewhere. So how do we, how do we do that? As, and I'll talk about it from a military police perspective. You know, the easiest way to start with mental resilience is, um, is the physical aspect of, of training, PT, um, because it, ha it has no military relevance whatsoever. It's just hard and horrible. And the more horrible the PT and the harder it is, the more mental commitment you need to put into it. Now, we all hate PT. We all like running. We all like getting shouted at. That's the same as any soldier. Um, but it, it serves a function. Um, and that's where they start. So, you know, your physical assessments, your physical assessments, the army actually doesn't care, you know, how fast you run a mile and a half. The army doesn't care, you know, how many pull-ups or whatever you can do. The army cares about, you know, what you can apply your mind to and whether you have the commitment to keep going, you know, and a very, you know, Ant Middleton, for example, is, you know, in the limelight at the moment and, you know, his TV show has highlighted, I think, in quite a good digestible manner, that you know the special forces and, and the army to a less descent you know have to train this but we have to we have to go through something to get to that point so we start with fizz um that's where it starts uh, and then it continues in everything we do so when we talk discipline 
we're not just saying stand, you know, the ability to stand still and do some drill, you know, marching around, the ability to stand there and get shouted at. No, no, no. We're, we're talking about, you know, lifestyle discipline. So this is your being asked to get up at five o'clock in the morning, having your bedroom ready for an inspection, having a level of detail to your kit and equipment and the cleanliness of your bed space that, you know, is that detailed. You have not missed nothing, but you've still managed to do your revision the night before. And this is where this resilience starts, starts to build because you're right. You know, we take all sorts of backgrounds into, into phase one. And, you know, the output is here. You know, that is, that is policy led. They have to pass X, Y, Z, you know, and everyone's journey to that point is very, very different. The quickest way to get there, though, like you said, is to nail the mental resilience or the commitment to mental resilience as quickly and as effectively as you can as a section commander. So, um, you know, that's like, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Sort of um, the utilisation of rewards, for example, task, reward, task, reward, task, reward. And the task gets harder every, every time to get that reward. But then, you know, I know we were discussing earlier that that, we want the ownership on the individual. So we want the individual to understand that I am going to be trained hard. I'm going to do physically arduous tasks. I'm going to be asked to do things that are not normal. And my mind is ready to accept that. And I'm ready to challenge myself and run with it. And, you know, when that penny drops with them, um, and for some of them, it's, it's really tangible. You can see some of them resist it for quite a while, depending on their background. When that penny drops, that all they've got to do, you know, the mind controls the body. Once that penny's dropped, that's it, they're away. And then you can start putting the pressure on. You can give them extra tasks, extra responsibility. But at all times with mental resilience, you know, we conform to values and standards in the army, don't we? You know, we have a very famous mnemonic, solid C or C drills, you know, and, you know, the one of them is selfless commitment and the, one of the other ones is discipline. You know, that's where we start to see the mental resilience come through. And you'll normally see it in guys that come from the most random background that you think society will look at them and go, they're a failure. And, that, and I can think of one guy called Stevenson, you know, years ago when I was in phase one, he tipped up. It was a guy from Southampton and um, he was a bit of a scrapper as a youngster. Didn't get his GCSEs. He'd been in trouble with the police. He'd pretty much been sent to the army as a sort of a last resort. And when I looked at him and I spoke to him, lovely guy, you know, re really polite individual. If I was a 16 year old in his peer group, I wouldn't have messed with him. Um, but and I looked at him and I thought, that, that's a leader. There, there is a senior NCO inside that man. He has just not had the parenting or the um, peer group to, just to shape that effort in the, in the right way. And it took two, I think it must have taken him two weeks just to get used to a bit of the discipline and how we do things in the army. And he found his home straight away. And, uh, and that was it. He had something to focus all that energy and what was anger previously into something positive, which was results driven. You know, he got to shoot weapon system, hit the target, positive reinforcement. I'm developing that skill set, you know, and then we, and he was a fit guy anyway. And then we could push him on PT harder than anyone else and push him and push him and push him. So he realized his actual boundaries was so his mental resilience was so good that you know his boundaries were so far actually beyond what we could probably push him or allow to push him should i say and then you take that guy and you make him a junior leader you know he's now been in training six seven eight weeks you know the pennies drop with him he gets the process he now starts to positively affect other people that are maybe behind so he then starts to internally help with the mental resilience of the youngs to say, look guys i can do this just got to do it like this here look at that and they create this brotherhood of, of friends and we all know friends from our phase one that you know we'll be friends with until the day we all die and then you start to see as a team as they start to gel as a team that there's this cohesive mental resilience and then as a team they become unbeatable they become this band of like brothers of you know soon to be warriors that are like committed to the process committed to being worked hard committed to learning because they want to achieve they want to pass off on the parade square in their regimental headdress having felt like they earned it and then when you've got people that are willing and mentally committed you start pushing that resilience and it may be the way that i'm then interacting with them starts to change you know i start to get a bit more distant a little bit more standoffish you know i start to make it a little bit more difficult for them i'm not so familiar so it's like you're breaking them in gently because you know what we delivered in colchester was hard 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 training over a six month period you know, people needed to hit that training cycle and be ready to like not be at home much and work, you know, and 
when you've got that, that's that's your start state. That's when you can really start, you know, doing stuff with the with the resilience aspect. Thank you very much for that, Clint. Just before we go, um, you've got a band called <laughs> The Embers. I don't know if you want to just talk about your band slightly and tell them what what you're doing in the future, because everyone in the army always has a civilian life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, a lot of people in the uh, civilian <laughs> don't understand that you've got an actual life outside of being in the army. So could, do you want to have a little chat about Beneath the Embers? Yeah. Uh, so a few years ago when we started working together back in uh, back in Colchester, you know, I've always been into music. It was either going to be music or the army when I left school. Um, I was at a certain age when, when we started working together and I decided that, you know, the, the end of my career, military career was in sight and I want to do something that I enjoy. And the, the military had shaped me you know, both mentally and, and physically and my ability to analyse and, you know, manage teams of people that I thought, you know, I'm best placed right now to, to pursue that dream of, of, of running a band. So, you know, after a, a year or two of finding the right members, writing some music, yeah, we've got a record deal, we released an EP and we're now touring. So, we're, you know, we're with Talia Tuneman in February next year, which was obviously scheduled for this March, but got moved. Um, we are currently recording the next the next album. And being in a band is just like being in the army, you know, it's the same as running any team. And what I've discovered is that, you know, musicians are, you know, fantastically talented and creative and awesome people to be around because they just think so differently to, to like the way the army is and the soldiers. But their end state's the same. It's results driven again. You know, they musicians need to be led, you know, and, and you'll find in any big famous band, there's one, there's one guy that, you know, really is the driver and, you know, the, the, the maker of that activity. And I kind of found my slot doing that with the guys, you know, I've been lucky that they're all ridiculously talented and they all, you know, so respectful of the military and the background that I have, that they go, Clint, you just, you deal with that stuff. We'll do with this stuff um, and that's led on to a beer deal so you know we've, we've we've got our own ale our own lager comes out in a month time we've got a whiskey that's about to be released and i'm very very privileged and grateful that you know civilian industry and business has been equally as supportive um you know not many soldiers get to play in a you know top level tour in heavy metal band and fingers crossed come 2023 i can you know that takes over my my professional life if i'm not doing stuff like this with you cool well, thank you very much, Clint. Um, and that's the end of today's episode. So thank you very much. Look forward to seeing you next week. Hi, and welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about leadership styles and how leadership styles develop your team and how they are an important factor of self-awareness. Um, a question that I always ask my learners is, does your team develop the leader or does the leader develop the team? And I think... Leadership styles often tell us which way the leader wants to lead and therefore how the team wants to react to that. And we're going to go through a number of different theories. Um, we've even got a, the British Army's um, leadership code to go through today as well and how they see leadership. And I think a lot of people will look at the British Army and just think the leadership in the British Army is very one dimensional, but it's not. The fact is that the British Army has um, a large facet of um, leaders in every single department and um, because it's all walks of life the British Army pulls people from every single walk of life and therefore there are many different leaders and um, the traditional old the Sergeant Major being shouting uh, shouting at his recruits that's portrayed on TV especially um, post Second World War um, is, is probably something that we want to pull away from um, from a British Army's perspective but also something that we can learn from in that sometimes that does need to be the way the leadership works. So let's get on with the rest of the session. So the aim is, aim of the video today are to talk about the different theories of leadership. We're going to talk about a number of specific ones. Uh, Kurt Lewin is particularly one. We'll go through six emotional um, leadership styles and the British Army's uh, leadership code. We're then going to talk about how that influences your team, how that develops um, and how affects your team. Um, we'll then comprehend your leadership style. Well, I'll ask that question, whether what your leadership style is, and then you can make some assumptions. Um, and I'll hopefully direct you to some places that you can go and have a look at and see if you find your leadership style there. And then also we'll talk about um, what will make you a better behavior, um, leader and what behaviors will help you become a better leader. So what is a leadership style? Um, well, 
a leadership style is just a way that you portray yourself in a way that um, other people either listen to you or take your lead from. Um, there is a saying, do as I say, don't do as I do. That technically is a leadership style, not a particularly good one, not something that I think a lot of people should follow, especially nowadays, but that still is a leadership style. Um, you've got many different types and some of the theories um, either show you what types of leadership you want, may be or what types you might want to be in the future um, or what you feel is the best leadership style for you and often that's the question that comes to the fore most often is that um, does the leader shape the team as its leadership style grows or does the team uh, or does the leader shape the team's leadership um, I don't think we'll ever get to the bottom of this. It's a bit like chicken and the egg. Um, and, and the question, is a leader born or is it, um, is it created? Um, often, I think it's a mixture of the two. The leader informs the team of how that leadership wants to work. And then the team then informs the leader how it wants to be led. But in between that, there becomes some sort of analysis or hypothetical thought process from the from the leader and the team itself to, to, to grow either together and then knit nicely and create a performing as team or do they pull apart and become more of a storming team as they develop. And we will get onto the performing storming element um, on a later video, but first and foremost, we've got to look at yourself and that's why self-analysis and self-awareness is probably more important at this stage. So we're going to just discuss some of the different types of leadership styles. We're going to go with um, a path goal theory um, promulgated in the 1970s. Um, you've got the Kurt Lewin um, leadership style uh, from the 30s, which pretty much just sets the stall out for a, for a lot of our leadership understanding. Uh, we've got the six emotional leadership styles, and they don't really inform us what leadership is but it sort of pigeonholes people and I think a lot of it is about crossover between all those emotional different uh, styles then you've got the British Army's leadership style uh, leadership code sorry and uh, what we'll see there is um, an understanding of how you've taken Kurt Lewin's uh, theory and then they've put it onto a scale mixed in with their almost their uh, the codes and ethics and morals of the British Army itself and so you've got a sliding scale and we'll and we'll talk through that sliding scale uh, process um, and then we've got some more specific uh, learner styles um, which are probably fall outside of any of the other theories but are there are prevalent and so therefore we should have a, just a quick look at them and see how they all work so path goal theory is more associated for me anyway in, in the individual projects something that I think you can use um, to galvanize a team that's been thrown together in order to achieve a single objective or a num small number of objectives rather than an, an encompassing leadership style um, that um, a leader should employ over a long period of time creating and melding a team together or over over a long period of time um, the path goal theory does have some really important elements to it, though, and um, and I, I don't. That's why I wanted to talk about it really, because I think that it, as a singular leadership style, I think it's really helpful. And once you start in putting that into a larger leadership understanding, then you can start using it on individual projects or for individual people. And so the theory goes around um, talking about the responsibilities of the leader. So um, it helps um, the team understand and achieve their, their goals. Um, it clears away all the objectives, uh, sorry, all the obstacles in the way of the team itself. So um, instead of placing problems for the team, it tries to remove those problems for the team to streamline that pathway through um, to, to clear leadership. Um, and it also offer, offer, um, offers rewards along the way. And so those rewards are there to provide, um, it's the carrot technically, so there's no stick, it's all carrot. So the leadership styles that support goal, um, path goal theory um, are the following. Supportive leadership, which provides an understanding um, of relationships with your team members. Developing leadership 
um, relationships with each member of your team and the team as a whole, providing them support throughout the project. You've got a directive leadership, and that's very task oriented. One single task, one single goal, everyone's working together to go and achieve that goal. Then you've got um, leadership work participation. So it's about um, helping the team develop um, a core understanding, decision-making understanding um, from where the team wants to go, where that project needs to go. So that team works together in order to achieve its goal because it's made that decision itself. And this works really well with sports teams as well. Um, whenever I work with, say, Salford City or Burnley FC, where there are academies, um, I ask about the, the values and standards that that team has got. And often it's been directed from the coaches or above. Um, but the best sort of decisions are made by the group because what happens is the group starts to police itself and those decisions then become an ethos. More than something that's being directed, it becomes more important to the team because it's their decision in the first place. And then you've got a team, uh, you've got um, achievement orientated uh, leadership. So that's bite sized chunks of achievements or tasks or endpoints that you can just supplement all the way through your course and gives everyone a sense of um, success at every step of the way. So um, you've got the six um, emotional leadership styles, and um, this is a, a good theory to to shape a leader. I think you need to have all these different types of leadership throughout um, your the course of your career and your the course of your life. But I don't think that anyone just sits in one of these. I think this you as emotions move anyway, you'll move through these different stages. And so there's a number of these different stages. Um, what they want to say is the pigeonhole into one of these types. Um, and as we will discuss to towards the end of the video, is that leadership isn't about just having one type. If you have one type of leadership, it grows very old very quickly. Therefore, you should be able to mix and match your leadership style in order to achieve the aims that your team wants and that you need to achieve. So visionary leader is somebody that is, is someone to follow, someone that says, come with me and I'll take you through to the other side. We'll achieve our aims together. Somebody that is very direct, off the cuff, instinctive. They use empathy, they use initiative in order to achieve their aims. It's not someone sat behind a desk, it's not someone that directs other people to do stuff, it's somebody that leads by example. The British Army has a large amount of individuals like this, especially at corporal and sergeant level. If you look back to the Afghanistan and Iraq conflicts, you had a lot of people who were not of, of old age, but led by pure ability to go and do the job together. You followed them because you trusted them with your life. The British Army has been really good on this, um, but there are plenty of other uh, types of leaders in other worlds that follow the same sort of thought process. If you look at football or sport, it's those sort of visionary leaders. You can imagine them at half time um, and you're, you're 2 0 down in a game, and, he, and he's the one that's saying, Right, follow me, I will get us through this. Do this with me, and I will provide us with the ability to go and do it. These people normally have a lot of quality in order to do their job in the first place. And everyone follows them because they trust them themselves. The coaching leader is next. This is somebody that would provide um, coaching and mentoring in order to facilitate leadership. So maybe maybe do it this way. This is something you could do. See what works for you. This is the sort of attitude that a, that a coaching leadership would have. Um, they will provide team members with individual goals and set their values and all, only to make them understand where they need to go and, and make them better as a result of that the coaching itself. A lot of this is to do with personality. A lot of it has to be with their coaching ability in the first place. You've got to be able to trust what they're telling you in the first place. So that experience and understanding has to be there. You wouldn't trust someone to be a scuba diver when they've never scuba dived before. So that's not really a coaching mechanism. So you've got to have some experience in that world in the first place. And that's when that leadership comes out because they're saying, I've tried these, I've, I've done the mistakes and you can learn from my mistakes. Try this, try that. Not too dissimilar to how 
most leaders work in the in the football coaching world as it as it is because they've already been there they've already got some achievements and then you're listening to them and understanding what went right for them and what went wrong for them affiliative leadership is often um, associated with developing the team after conflict it's somebody that um, the team comes first the individuals come first working as a collective so this is very emotionally driven it's very um, motivational driven but it's also very individual driven and so you what you're trying to do is just try and give that team a little bit of TLC especially after a bit of conflict or a little bit of an argument or after a storming session which may be that people didn't feel like that they've got their points over or have their voices heard giving them an understanding of, of how you can provide that uh, arm around the shoulder will help them develop as an individual not always going to be possible especially when you've got tight deadlines and you're working towards um, key objectives and sometimes you just have to just feed this in at certain stages just to develop individuals and like I said earlier it's not about having a one cap fits all this can't work if you're not able to change your hats to make sure that you are a different leader to each individual you are the leader that they require every single time that they walk through that door in the morning. A democratic leader is somebody that asks the team their opinion, gathers that information and then makes an answer out, out of that. This is great, this is really good leadership style, if time permits. Sometimes this cannot always work. You can't be a democratic leader if time doesn't permit. Remember, time is the undefeated enemy. If you've ever got any tight deadlines, then being a democratic leader sometimes allow, prevents you from getting the answer that you need to have because you've got to ask too many questions, you're going to ask too many people. If you have time, then a democratic leader makes everyone feel like they've got a voice, they've got an understanding, and that they're part of the, pro the solution, not part of the problem. So it's very empowering, very much motivational, but also can damage your uh, decision-making process if you haven't got the time to do so. A pace-setting leader is somebody that um, drives the team. It's very goal-orientated. Um, you do not have time for people who cannot keep up with you. You are going towards your, achieve, your goal and you will achieve it. You drive forward and all those people that can follow, great, get on board, we're going now. Everyone that can't, get left behind and so you've got to have pace setting as a leadership trait you've got to have that ability to go and achieve that aim and those high performing individuals that you have in your team will love pace setting leaders however if you've got some people in your team that aren't quite as good as you or aren't quite as good as other members in your team then this could be very daunting because they are no longer being supported they're being dragged along and they don't feel comfortable so therefore give them the opportunity Pace setting is really good for tight deadlines. Come on, do as I say right now, let's go. But then have some consideration for other people. The commanding leader. This um, probably, we'll, we'll come across this quite a few times now. Um, the different type of leader is, is do what I tell you right now. Um, this sometimes um, gets pinged against the British Army's way of dealing with leadership and we will talk about that when we talk about transactional and transitional uh, leadership in the British Army um, and there is a time and place for all of that tight deadlines really important to just do what you're told and get it done as quickly as possible but this doesn't really give your team much scope in growth and it doesn't give them an opportunity to talk through their problems maybe some of the solutions that they they could find you don't give them time to do that you're just telling them the answer um, this sort of leader doesn't really work well with growth or development of their team but they can be really good if you've got a big problem and it needs to be solved very quickly that sort of leadership comes into its fore and and that's why although it's it's probably not a great leadership style consistently because people get tired of this very very quickly it can in small um, bursts when when things really matter they can be really useful so now we move on to Llewellyn's uh, leadership style and and often um, uh, this is a really big subject and, and a lot of our leadership styles are driven out of uh, Lewin's 
um, theory and um, he, he, he sort of builds three types of leadership um, styles and then instead of being pigeonholed you're sort of on a sliding scale between them and um, and I think you, you know you've got your autocratic and uh, laissez fair and then you've got your democratic in the middle um, and you sort of uh, as you swing between the, two, the three they, that would depend on the sort of team that you have so if you are um, a high performing team, then you might be less of that. If you have a low performing team or a, or a very newly formed team with no experience, then you might be very autocratic in, um, in style. And therefore, um, it'll be this swing the, all the way through that your leadership style will alter. So you're altering your leadership style to technically the team in this, in this theory. So the authoritarian style, which we start off here, um, is very much like that last style, um, style we spoke about um, in the six emotional uh, leadership styles. Authoritarian, very much do what I tell you to do right now. This is a great way to, to build um, a, a very early um, forming team in order just to get them to start working the way that you want them to be working. Um, you've often got this sort of idea that um, a autocratic leader is is uh, some major shouting at people on a parade square, um, or maybe a big boss in a, a CEO in a in a large corporation shouting at his employees just to go and do what they're being told to do. That's not often the case. You might get recruits first into the British Army feel like they're working in an autocratic leadership style. But what you'll find is that it's not quite as autocratic as you would think, um, because there's a lot of growth for those individuals as they go along. The growth is the shouting. The growth is that understanding of, of what happens if it goes wrong. So the autocratic leadership style can be used in a learning style itself, but sparingly, because often it wears very thin very quickly and actually you don't achieve the aims that you need to achieve often because there's too much stick and not enough carrot so autocratic um it, it, it's a leadership style that you can use in order to facilitate small short-term tasks something that's very immediate i always think of autocratic being um you know you're in a position where the enemy's firing on on your location um and you just need to get through the next 10 minutes just so then you can survive autocratic leadership at that moment in time is exactly what you need it to be just get up do what i tell you to do and you will live you will get through this um if you had a democratic style that point or um, then uh, you know a participative style at that point then you end up with this idea that um, you, you'd be sat there forever to try and make up a decision because some people won't like it and some people will like it and you'll never make a consensus that's when you need the autocratic leader you need someone just to say shut up get this done now I'm telling you go and do it and give them a boot technically um, but then the other side of that is that a lot of people don't want to be autocratic and end up wanting to be more democratic or less unfair. But that's not how leadership works in a lot of workplaces. You always tend to fall closer to autocratic rather than democratic. So, for example, when you walk into your onto your floor plate and you're handing out work, you're not asking their opinion. You're just firing out the work that needs to be done. You've been told to do it. Therefore, you're telling everyone else to do it. That's not really democratic. You're no longer involving them in the decision-making process. You're actually being very autocratic here. So a lot of people will say that they're not autocratic. They'll probably sit more democratic, um, but in actual fact, a lot of the work that we do is autocratic because we just get told to do it and that's what we need to do. Lewin's um, democratic leadership style is, is somebody that can go out and find out um, the decision-making process the, of their team to find out their answers. It's very much team-orientated, very much goal-orientated for the team. Um, 
you were there talking to the team and asking them, what do you think? How, do you, how would you attack this? Now, this is very teacher orientated. So when you're sat in a classroom, instead of giving them the answers, the teacher needs to draw those answers out of them. You give them the answers in a roundabout way and then ask them to sort of come up with their own solution. Um, democratic only works if you actually take that decision forward. Um, a lot of people like to be involved in the process, but then they'll still make the decision that they made in the prior. Um, or they're confirming it. And we'll talk about confirmation and the way that we work our decision-making processes out in a, in a later video. And we start talking about decision-making and problem-solving. But what you've got to be very careful of here is that you feel like them giving you the answer that you wanted and not the answer that they're actually giving you. And so democratic is very, very... Um, there, there's certain skills you need to portray. The skills that you... Are listening skills active listening being one of the most important skills here um, and being able to understand the information that they're trying to give you. Democratic uh, leadership is often um, about giving your team the ability to give you the answers. But if you are not listening to those answers correctly, not taking that information on, then you don't fall inside this correct, inside this uh, leadership style. So I probably have to apologize to any French speakers here because less than fair for me, well, with a Burnley accent, it sounds awful. Um, so I do apologize to any French speakers out there. Um, this is a, a leadership style that gives all the authority to the team. Delegation is key here. Delegating, um, respons not responsibility, just the tasks. The leader still takes the responsibility. The leader cannot offshoot the... the, the um, responsibility to his team they cannot say well they said they'd do this because you that's no leadership at all there's no leadership whatsoever in that throwing your team under the bus will not support you as being a leader whatsoever so les affair is more about giving the team the authority to do what they need to do and make their decisions that they need to make this is really great in a high performing team you just get the team to go on. And I always think about this as being um, the F1 Formula team, Formula 1 team that sorts out the vehicle as it comes into its pit stop. No one's overarching. No one's telling everyone what to do or make sure you drill that hole first and, and, and make sure you put that uh, bolt in next. No one's telling them that. They all know their job. They all know what they need to do. They just get on with it. You give them decisions. If they need to do that first, then they go and do that first. Time is really important, but their high-performing team knows what, exactly what they need to do. Now, if you're a leader of a team that's very specialist, is dealing with um, a specialist subject, and you've got specialists in your team, then this sort of leadership style is really great. Let them come up with their decisions. I'd rather be involved in the decision-making process, but I might not have an opinion. Just listening to those sort of leaders, uh, sorry, those sort of team members, understanding where their decision-making process is going to be will help me later on become a better leader. So then I can sort of interject with a little bit more information. But let those individuals who are really high-performing get on with their task. Don't stop them and ask them to quantify it because that will drive them lower in their... Um, their production, their um, product um, output. So, so bring it back, let them get on with it, and then just reap the rewards. So we'll now move on to the British Army's leadership code. And underpinning the Army's leadership code, because there's a number of levels to this, so we're going to try and break through the different levels of the leadership code. So under underlying... Um, themes to this as the vision, the support and the challenge elements. So the vision um, is about having somebody who uh, prov provides a vision for a team, um, creates shared goals and understanding. Um, this can be through communication, uh, documentation or verbally um, or actually role modeling. So somebody that can say, um, follow me, I'm going to be able to do this. So that's where providing that vision, that understanding of, of how the team is inspired. Um, then you've got the support element. So each of your team members needs to be supported um, and provided with understanding so that they can grow as individuals. This is to be fair and consistent throughout. Um, and you've got to show confidence 
in the team and the team elements um, and uh, the team individuals. And then the challenge phase. Um, the, the Army Leadership Doctrine actually talks about how um, people can, can grow as part of being challenged. And I probably agree with that to a certain extent. Um, when people are faced with challenge, that's when you actually see where their leadership comes out. So um, having a challenge element to the underpinning theme is really important. How do you challenge your individuals? And what stages can you put, ramp that challenge up to provide them with more um, of a sterner challenge, um, an understanding of, of where that challenge leads them to, some sort of achievement at the conclusion of that challenge as well. So the army's taken Lewin's idea of having an um, autocratic and democratic leader and used uh, the wording transformational and transac uh, transactional leaders. Um, and it puts them on a sliding, uh, sliding scale, which we will talk about later because it's got different elements of its um, code entwined um, on that scale itself. But at the very ends, you've got this transactional and transformational leader. Um, where you sit on that slide will, will depend on the circumstances and what you're trying to achieve. And so the British Army is just trying to give you a steer into where you sit um, at any one moment. We're going to talk about transformation. This is more of the coaching style that we had before um, in the six emotional leadership styles or the um, autocratic, sorry, the democratic uh, leader in uh, Llewellyn's um, leadership style. This is about emotion, understanding, uh, connecting with each of your, um, your team members, bringing out the best of them individually but empowering to, to do so as well. Um, it's not quite fully allowing them to make all the decisions, so it's not laissez-faire, but you are allowing them input into that decision-making process. Um, you are going to have an all-encompassing vision um, that they are partly involved in. Um, you're going to ask them their input, you're gonna trust their input, you're gonna trust the way that they want to do their job but then you're going to provide, provide them with the oversight and the umbrella. If it all starts going wrong, then you're going to take it for them and you're not going to leave them out in the cold. A transactional is obviously the other side of the scale to the transformational that we just discussed about. Um, so it's very aut autocratic, uh, very much, do as I say, very quick, very um, discipline orientated, um, and it's very time orientated. So the, the more... Um, important and quick the decision needs to be made the more autocratic you end up being um, and therefore more transactional rather than trans, uh, transformational this is more um, for the scenarios in the leadership code anyway it's, a, it's about uh, discipline it's about reward it's about being very set in the in stone about what you're going to achieve and what you're not going to achieve um, if you look on the battlefield about how um, a transactional or transformational uh, leader should be. I'd hope that um, in, in really serious situations, then you're gonna be more transactional rather than transformational. Um, I always think about leadership styles. I always um, lead back to a book um, uh, on, on the six, the Colchester Six, who were murdered um, in Iraq back in 2003. Um, and I just think back to Sergeant HJ, um, who was the sergeant who was, who was running the section at the time, and he had an opportunity to get away. Um, and the um, interpreter had shown him a way out. There was a way out through the back window. He'd had a section of six, uh, five other individuals in the team, um, and they'd been surrounded by um, a large group of um, disaffected locals who had been um, very roughly treated by the British Army previously um, and didn't like the fact that the British Army was there in the first place. Um, and this is probably the, one of the turning points to the Iraq conflict uh, where the population started to turn against the British um, Army. We were seen as liberators when we first went in, but now uh, as time had gone on and we were starting to impose almost um, a westernised rule and we wanted to like create a democracy for these individuals we wanted to change their way of life um, and stop oppression of other individuals especially the weak 
then other people started to take up arms against us. We have Jam, who wanted to take up arms anyway. And therefore, we have this um, powder keg in Alamara, um, which had pretty much been left by Saddam Hussein throughout his tenure as, as um, um, in charge of Iraq. And uh, we were there trying to help and support people and bring them on. And they didn't really want it. They wanted to live their life as they wanted to live. They were tribal. Um, and they didn't like the idea of having um, these Westerners, these Brits, come along and tell them how they should live their life. Um, it became a powder keg, became a big problem. And the RMP there were trying to help the local police. Uh, we'd go down and support the local police how to do their job. And, um, and give them advice on how to do policing, train them efficiently to become better policemen rather than just bouncers um, at a local bar who use very, very brutal tactics. Um, and instead we try to bring them into the 21st century in, in the ways of policing. Um, so they were there trying to teach these, um, these police officers and this mob descended on the police station and attacked it and HJ had this opportunity to leave and um, he didn't he, he stayed with his team and I just think back to that leadership code um, when, when and I always think about uh, that situation what I would do in that situation would I have made the same decision I hope I hope I would have made that same decision I think um, I think if anybody knows me they would probably say I would stay with my team and I'm, and I'm internally um, proud of HJ uh, for his actions that day. I'm, I'm proud of all the, the team members that day um, who, who, who all sadly lost their lives, including HJ. Um, but, um, but particularly that individual, um, because he had that opportunity to leave. He didn't, he didn't take it. He stayed with his team, um, even if it meant his own death. So the British Army's leadership code has this acronym, uh, LEADERS. Um, so lead by example, encourage thinking, apply reward and discipline, demand high performance, encourage confidence in the team, recognize individual strengths and weaknesses, and strive for team goals. It's a struggle to say that's an acronym for leaders. Um, it's not quite C drills, um, and it's not quite an understanding, you know, it's not succinct. However, it still gets its um, thought process over. And what we'll see in a minute is that they put this on that sliding, that sliding scale between transformational and transactional leaders and where each one of these elements lie. Um, so you, you need to uphold each element of the, of the leadership code by being able to span both the transformational to the transactional leader. And that's, I think that's the leadership code in a, in a nutshell. It gives you the framework, it tells you where you can sit and where you should sit when you're dealing with certain circumstances. So, for example, if we're leading by example, you're going to be very transformational at that point. Um, whereas if you are applying reward and discipline, you're going to be transactional. And so we'll have a look in that detail. So you can see the, the scale here. So you've got your transactional on the left hand side and your transformational on the right hand side. And as you can see, the leader acronym is then basically split um, across the spectrum of that um, leadership scale. So at the top end, you've got applied discipline because you're expected to be very transactional when you're dealing with discipline. There can be no give or take. Um, you have to be consistent and you have to be direct. Same for reward. You shouldn't be rewarding certain individuals with, with um, more praise than other individuals. You shouldn't be basically um, patting more people on the back than um, because they're your friends or the people that you're, or you work with on a regular basis. So therefore, you have to be very transactional at that point. Very much clear cut, very direct. And as you move down the scale, you'll see that we move towards that lead by example element of the transformational leadership. Um, you'll see the demand high performance, probably a little low for me, um, you know, more middle ground. Um, but I think that's more about um, having that, um, that you should always demand high performance, that every team should always be striving to be better. 
um, that you recognize individual strengths and weaknesses. You should be working with your team to see what your weaknesses and strengths are and then complementing them with other team members. So if somebody is really weak in certain areas, then you use the strengths of others to, to help them, to bolster them in the right positions. Strive for those team goals. I think that probably goes with high performance, but on this scale, it sits more towards the trans, uh, transformational area. Um, and, the, and the encouraged thinking is definitely something transformational. I feel that's probably further up the scale um, that, than, uh, than where it currently is. But that's how the British Army sort of structures its leadership code, sets the groundwork of its vision, then um, with its underpinning vision and challenge um, and support, it then provides them with a framework, which is the leader's acronym, um, and then on the scale between the transactional and the trans, uh, transformational and where you sit. And what the leadership code for me says is that you should be able to span both sides of that spectrum. In line with um, what is our leadership styles, um, there's, a, there's a website, uh, mindtools.com, that has a really good questionnaire. It uses the, the wound um, th um, theory where you can just challenge yourself is 12 simple questions. It does pigeonhole, it does fit you in a box. And again, it's not, um, it's not context driven, which is a lot of this. I don't like theory when it sort of pigeonholes you. You can certainly get a feel for how you might react to certain situations. But just because you feel you might make that decision or you would like to make that decision doesn't mean that you make that decision in real life. The only really way, real way you can see what sort of leader you are is when you're in the mix, when you're actually in that position and you're actually making those key decisions. Do, are you autocratic or are you democratic? Are you transactional or transformational? That sort of individual, you can only learn that by being in those positions, in those situations and learning at that moment in time. What I will also say is that you should be able to explain what you want to be as a leader. Now, this is part of your own personal development. You might not be there right now, but you might want to be there in the future. So what, how do you want to lead? Do you want to be transformational or do you want to be transactional? Do you want to be able to swap? Do you want to be able to move between the different areas in order to facilitate the best leadership for each of the team members that you have? Or do you want to be quite constant? I want to just be a transactional leader and everyone else can just follow what I tell them to do. Um, I think you're probably cutting off your nose despite your face there, but that's some, some ways that that might work for you, it won't, but it won't work in other ways. And also the last question really is I only want to ask is how do you want to be led? How do you feel your leader should be? Should they be impartial? Should there be somebody that puts their arm around you and, and helps you to get over your problems? Or do you just want them to show you the way? This is often the way that a good leader should be able to see leadership in other individuals, should be able to take on those little aspects from different leaders and then incorporate them into their own leadership style itself. So you get, when you see somebody doing something good in a way that you think, I like that, I'm gonna take that, I'm gonna put that into myself. Or, I don't like that, I'm going to stay away from that in the future. So what, how do you want to be led? Put all your comments below, um, I'd love to read them, I'd love to understand what your experiences are with leadership styles as well. From my own perspective about leadership, I always like the idea that I can mix my leadership up. I can be autocratic or I can be democratic. The circumstances demand me uh, that they make demands of me and my team, I can change and I'm a chameleon in order to facilitate the end product. If my team wants me to be more, more autocratic, I can be more autocratic. If they want me to be more democratic, I can bend that way as well. I mix it up. I change the way that I am in order to facilitate and get the best out of all my team members and also to achieve the aim. You cannot forget that some leaders their whole objective is to get to the end point. The team needs to get to the end point. And therefore, your leadership style changes as a result of that. I would also say, while being um, mixing everything up, is that you need to be consistent. You need to be consistent to those individuals. 
they want to be able to trust you and be able to come to you and you're not moving between transitional and transactional when you're meeting them. They want to see that same person. They might not see the same person you are with other team members, but they want to see the same person that they meet on a constant basis. So if they feel like they have a voice and you take that voice away, then they're no longer feeling that you've got their confidence and that you are, um, are, are being consistent. So therefore, you need to understand what leadership style you use for each of those individuals and be consistent with those individuals. And last but not last, not least, is to be honest. Be honest with yourself and be honest with your team. If you're out of your depth and your team is there to support you, be honest with them. Get them to be um, the conduit that gets you to the end point. That's les on fair. Uh, be more democratic. But also, if you are confident and you know the answer and you're going to get in there, then show them the way, especially if they're a low-performing team. Be honest with your individuals. Be honest with yourself to get to where you need to get. Hi, welcome back. This week, we're going to be talking about how leadership um, is governed and uh, supported by inclusivity, diversity, ethics and morality. Now, I understand these are quite emotive subjects um, and some people probably won't agree with some of the things that I'm going to say today. Um, but what I'm going to try and talk about um, will be centered around my understanding of inclusivity, diversity, ethics and morality. Um, having been in the army for 22 years, I've seen uh, morality and ethics uh, being played out at a, a really difficult stage, um, challenging everybody's thoughts and uh, processes um, and, and the grey areas that survive within ethics and morality. Inclusivity and diversity, um, I'm going to be talking about them as well. Uh, we'll talk at length about how team composition um, is influenced by your inclusivity, inclusivity and diversity. And, um, and one thing I will say about that is that uh, this is not about race, to me anyway. It's not about gender or sexuality or any of the characteristics um, protected by the Equality Act 2010. Um, although we will touch upon that, um, it is also about every other part of inclusive, inclusivity and diversity, about what makes you um, and your team inclusive and diverse. It's not just about um, the, your race or your gender or your ethnicity. Often it's just about different perspectives and how you look at different perspectives to get um, the most out of your team. Okay, so if you have the opportunity, please like, subscribe, and uh, turn on the alerts for my channel. All that would be greatly appreciated. Um, if you have any comments, put them down below. Um, I'm sure that they, this might generate a lot of conversation. So please feel free to, um, to discuss these. And, um, and I will try and interact with you as much as physically possible. Um, and without further ado, let's get on with the session. So my aims during this video will be to discuss um, inclusivity, diversity. We'll also talk about um, some of the morals and ethics um, and uh, moral and ethic leadership. Um, this video is not about race, um, although it will touch upon um, some aspects of uh, race. Um, it's not about gender, although again, it will talk about um, like issues that surround gender. And what I'm trying to do is I'm just trying to bring forth the idea that we can have uh, diversity and inclusivity and it doesn't have to harm your team. It doesn't have to harm um, your um, outcomes. It doesn't have to harm your product. Uh, what it can do is it can just bring different aspects to light, to your attention that you can use then to be a better leader or to even be um, a better company. Um, we're going to talk about how we can use diversity and inclusion to make your company better uh, and use it as a business strategy. Um, and we're going to be talking about how um, unconscious bias can force you into making bad decisions. Um, we'll discuss unconscious bias a little bit. Um, I have discussed it in one of my previous videos. Um, I think it was my first video that I did. And so one of the things that we will probably discuss in this video will be the outcomes of um, unconscious bias. 
And then we'll talk about morals, ethics, and integrity. And those are pretty much hand to hand for me in the way that, um, especially the British Army works, um, and how I feel that companies can be better, both ethically, morality wise, but also have with them um, create um, loyalty. What is inclusivity? Um, without trying to be uh, political or try to win brownie points um, with um, either the left or the right uh, wing um, sects, I think the most important thing for, for as a business leader and as a team leader, as a, as a leader himself, um, is, is that you can get inclusivity and it can up the game of your team. Um, by having a team feel completely and utterly accepted, that their points of view will always be listened to, um, that their voices can be heard, um, that you are that you're comfortable in your surroundings, um, and that no one fears um, the changes or the direction that team is taking, then you have inclusivity. Now that might mean that you need to bend to the will of your team. And a good leader is somebody that can bend to the will of the team when necessary. And the team needs to be able to bend to the will of the leader also when necessary. And when we talked about our different types of leadership in a previous video, when we talked about um, autocratic and democratic leaders, that's, and we talked with the association of time, this is when you start getting that influx and, and movement from your team as well as your leader. So less time you have, the more autocratic leader you have, the more flexibility the team needs to have. But if you've got a more democratic leader, and you've got more time, then the team can be taking more of the, the time and therefore the leader can bend towards the will of the team a little bit more. You're going to listen to your team and let them talk to you. And I'm, we will discuss in communication um, active listening. This is going to be absolutely key when we're talking about how a team can feel inclusive and that every single person's point of view is listened to, understood, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to enact on it. What you're just doing is you're just listening to what they're telling you and taking their point of view and understanding it. You don't just dismiss it. You just don't park it. You don't be dismissive with them as an individual. You listen to it. If it's got value, use it. If it doesn't, tell them so, thank them, and then move on. So diversity. Very touchy subject. Something that's going to um, enrage some people and um, to challenge other people and to other people it's their bread and butter um, it's very emotive subject and something that's always going to cause um, issues as a team leader and as a team um, for me um, i don't want us to feel like um, we're force feeding diversity because that's not how a team works you don't um, damage a team that's working well just for the sake of diversity but what you can do is you can supplement a team uh, with diversity to give you a different aspect and we will talk about that in a second about how you can add diversity to your team to think outside the box and get answers that you might not have come up with yourself. True diversity um, is not just about the 10 protected characteristics. Um, true diversity is the diverse nature of the entire team. And I've spoke about it previously. If you've got team people on your team that talk the same, have the same education that you have, come from the same place, um, have had the same upbringing, um, uh, of the same ethnicity, of the same gender, then you're always going to get the same answers. And, and I don't think that's a challenging position to be in if you're a leader. I don't see that that's something that a leader should aspire to be. You don't need to accept um, answers from people who are just going to agree with you. So from a law perspective, there are 10 uh, protected characteristics, which we'll go through on the next slide. Um, and uh, they are protected by law and your business, your company um, should always have a quality policy that protects those individuals. Um, and they're really important when it comes to recruitment, uh, really important when it comes to discipline. And so those should always be upheld as much as physically possible. Um, we've got two definitions on this um, slide as well. And we'll talk about um, unfair and how 
unfair is defined and that is if any of the characteristics influence a decision affecting them so whether that is uh, them not getting their job because they're disabled or they're not getting the job because they're female or they are being sacked because they're of a different race or gender or they are, um, they have changed their gender and then you've got harassment as well um, and that is any unwanted or unwelcome words or actions that normally cause distress if you intentionally offend somebody in the workplace um, and you do it out of malice then that is an offence you you are committing an offence and therefore what we shouldn't be doing is making people feel bad just because they're a different gender or a different colour um, or that they have um, a different thought processes than we do so here are the protected characteristics um, in law under the Equality Act 2010 and I do get the irony I'm a white guy um, I'm um, heterosexual um, I'm able-bodied um, and, I, and I totally do get it I mean I, I'm here talking about um, protected characteristics and, and diversity and inclusion and I'm probably um, the epitome of, of somebody that um, generally isn't inclusive and doesn't have very much um, inclusivity but what I want to do is I just want to challenge some of the thought processes that some people have I've seen it I've, I've worked with it I, I mean I am I, I felt it myself um, and it goes both ways and um, and there is there is opportunities that I've had that um, that weren't available to me because of um, my my race my gender and my sexuality um, and that, that I was able-bodied as well and that and I can totally see that I mean I, I, I'm I am I'm understanding enough to be able to see that um, that there has to be a positive discrimination against some individuals to help them along and um, inclusivity does help that uh, and diversity does help that and if that means that I m miss out on a couple of opportunities yeah I'm, I'm going to be a little bit gutted uh, but if it gives other people the opportunity that uh, they might not have got because of that then I'm all for it. Feeling safe in the workplace is a really important aspect of um, team building and developing a team. Um, as a leader, you should make the workplace as welcoming and um, as homely as physically possible. I'm not asking you to get out comfy chairs and make everyone a cup of tea and biscuits. What I'm actually saying is that they all should feel at home and welcome in the workplace in order to get the best out of them. If you have a team that don't feel like they can be themselves, then you're not gonna get the answers or the products that you require out of them and you're not going to get the best out of them either. What we have to do is make sure that um, each of your team members feel welcome in the workplace. Um, if they make a complaint it's listened to. The people listen to um, and enact on people's complaints. They're then just not dismissed and the ideas that they have or the, the problems that they have are just swept under the rug. Um, they are not a statistic either. They don't want to be treated like a statistic. And they don't want to be referred to as uh, the disabled person um, or the, um, the, the girl on the maternity. They have names, um, they have real life issues that are important to them. And as a good team leader, you should be listening to people's problems and you should be taking them aboard and helping them solve those problems so you can get the best out of them when the problems um, are arising. We used to do this before operational tours a lot. We felt that um, the best soldiers were the ones that didn't have the problems at home and didn't have um, worries that would constantly plague them during the operational tour. We wanted, to concent we wanted them to concentrate directly on the job at hand um, and not be sidelined by problems that might have been occurring at home. So the first and foremost thing that we would always do, we'd uh, appoint a family's liaison or a welfare officer that would be attached to the families to make sure that the family could function as a unit with the, the soldier, the, um, whoever was in the army, whether that was the mother or the father or away. And, um, and they had a support mechanism. That made the family feel um, more confident about supporting the partner um, on operations and it also meant the soldier was confident that their family was being looked after back at home. We had 
um, the military police there so then if there were any problems with um, criminal damage or thefts that they were looked after and they were dealt with correctly and the patch was well policed and that would also lighten the load for the soldiers on operational tours what you'd also have is um, a, a period of time just before the operational tour where welfare would be almost key to make sure that every single soldier had all their um, problems and issues dealt with before they went away anything that might crop up um, and that included um, recording of wills um, and recording of death letters um, and making sure that we had all those in in place if the worst came to the worst um, and that the soldier and the family could be well looked after even if the worst came to the worst so we've already spoke about some of the um, the benefits of diversity and inclusion and we, we talked about um, that you get different answers um, for different solutions different ways of working you might challenge yourself how many times have you you looked at a company and they've started um, doing things that you, you might not appreciate um, but they will help people of different um, diverse groups so for example um, iOS 14 that got released the other day um, that has uh, more accessibility um, options for people who are um, partially sighted or are deaf um, and so they've changed their way of thinking in order to um, in, in order to cater for people of different diverse groups they wouldn't have come up with that if they didn't have the right people and the right job in the first place and they probably didn't have them for the iOS updates on previous uh, years but Apple seem to have changed it around and they're looking in a different direction and they're moving forward in the right directions to encompass different ways of working for those individuals that need them you look at your iPhone especially on the new iOS update and there's loads of functionality that you probably don't even use but just because you don't use them doesn't mean that anybody else doesn't use them they're always useful for somebody else and we shouldn't dismiss the ideas that other people need um, functionality where we don't need functionality and when we don't think about that functionality that's when you miss things and that's when your company is missing the chance to open its doors to people of different diverse groups unconscious bias is something that we all have in us um, it's back from when we were all cave men and women um, and it, we would look after our tribe or um, our family uh, by protecting ourselves against people that didn't look like us and didn't sound like us now that doesn't help us in a modern world where we're more accepting of people who are different from us and we're more accepting that other people have better ideas than we have just because they've had a different upbringing or a different past it doesn't help um, that that thought process is the first thing that jumps to mind as soon as we start talking about inclusivity and diversity because we have this unconscious bias and any good leader should be able to fight against that unconscious bias they should ask themselves serious questions as you would do in your self-reflection um, and your mindfulness on, on whether you did something right or wrong um, on a previous encounter then we should also be reflective on our ability to combat unconscious bias with unconscious bias um, it attacks the uh, the reasoning behind what we it attacks what we feel is right um, and we fall back into this malaise of, of of being with people that either are our race or our gender or maybe even the accent you can just hear you can hear my Burnley accent from miles away and I always hear a Burnley accent I can hear a Burnley accent and I know it's from Burnley immediately so um, that unconscious bias draws us towards people that are of our kin or of our race or of our gender we as a leader should be able to fight against this we should understand it we have it and therefore we should combat it we do not judge other people for what they look like how they dress or how they act what we judge them on is their outcomes and their products do they do the job are they good at it do they achieve the aims that you set out from is it the correct correct quality those are those are the things that you should be judging people on 
And that is it. What you have to do as a leader is you should uncover um, unconscious bias within the team. You should get rid of it wherever you can. You seek it out, you challenge your, uh, your team, and you challenge their unconscious bias. Once you've got a good idea of what, how your team acts, then you can educate them and bring them out. Sometimes it just has to be rooted out and got rid of at its first point. So ethical leadership, very important at this moment of time. I think we've become more ethical um, and uh, more ethical leadership centric um, due to the financial crash of 20, uh, 2008. And, um, and I think it's an important facet of our job, um, how we can be transparent um, in our decision making, how we can be uh, more consultive of our decisions and how we're making our decisions and that we're not making them in isolation. I know the, the civilian police and the army have, have moved towards a, an ethical leadership um, thought process in protecting the way that um, it does its job by having people talk to each other on a number of occasions in order to get an all-compassing um, answer rather than just one individual's thought process or one individual's direction. It gives us a sense of community. We're working as a team. We're working um, to a single goal together. Um, and we're going to reward change and innovation in that we're going to help other people feel like they can make change and make innovation and it's going to change the culture of our organization for the positive. Moral leadership leans nicely from um, ethical leadership in that um, there are some basic questions that you should be asking yourself. Um, about your morality and that uh, can be down to um, could you be proud of your behavior I always ask the question would my mum be proud of my behavior and if I think my mum would be ashamed of my behavior then that's not the way I should be behaving um, how would your friends and family uh, feel if they know you have done something would they back you would they consider your understanding and 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 back you 100 percent, or would they just feel like that's you know it's quite a selfish point of view and 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 that you've not chosen the right path there has your behavior been honest and fair and respectful of other individuals um have you done what you can do to get the best out of every single individual and have you helped them become better along the way and are you acting within your organisation's culture? Now, every organisation has a culture. Um, we, we are moving quickly towards an ethical culture across the board. And we will talk about cultures uh, when, we're doing with, uh, when we're working with uh, managing people and leading people. Cultures are a massive part of business and how you can build a culture and how you can change your culture within your organisation. But are you acting within... Um, the strategic operational culture of your organization. You, as a leader, will need to show your team how to act. They will listen to what you have to say, but they will listen more to what you do. And the old adage is, um, you do as I say and not as I do, that's gone out the window, and now you do as I do and as I say. Um, you've got to have um, cultural moral, morals as well. And so, Every culture has its own moral compass um, and um, every, every uh, type of individual have their own, um, their own uh, cultural moral. So to hark back to my British Army days when we talked about moral courage, um, this is about making the right decision on a really bad day when no one else is watching. Can you say that you made the right decision? Um, moral courage, especially in operations, is absolutely vital to every British serviceman. The old saying um, is that you should do as you ought and not as you want to. That's a moral that the British Army tries to instill into all its soldiers and that um, every officer should instill into their own team. Even if it means that you have to sacrifice something that you want, in order to achieve it. That's what real moral courage is. Being honest with yourself and thinking about the team rather than yourself. Having integrity builds loyalty. Doing the right thing, choosing the right path, being truthful and honest and authentic 
develops loyalty within your team. Your team will learn to trust you because the decisions that you'll make are the right ones, not only for them, but for the team as a whole. The best thing that you'll ever get from your team is the trust that you are making the right decisions. If you are a moral leader, if you are an ethical leader, then you should be able to instill loyalty within your team. Having all those facets, including having the diversity of a, a team that feels like it's inclusive and having a team that um, knows exactly um, the path that it's going to take because it trusts its leader, that's how you get the best results. So that's today's session. Well done on finishing the video. Um, I hope that you have things to talk to me about. I hope that I've um, either uh, brought something to your understanding or maybe even touched upon something that you don't agree with. Please put your comments below. I'll try and answer as much as I physically can. Don't be silly about it though. I don't want arguments and I'm not interested in arguments. Um, if it's constructive, I'll listen to it and I'll reply back. Thank you very much. Please like and subscribe the video as much as physically possible. Get it shared. I'd like this conversation to go out further. Um, and um, thank you very much. Cheers for listening.